Let me give you a little bit background about the quantitative polymerase chain reaction, qPCR, uh, that's used for testing SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the COVID-19. It's also called the nucleic acid test as opposed to the serological test that looking for antibodies. The structure of the virus is here. Uh, the most notorious protein is the spike protein, but there are other structural proteins such as the E protein, the M protein, and also the nucleocapsid protein N that's encapsulated the RNA in the center of the virus envelope and they protect this very unstable RNA molecule. The first step is to collect the sample, uh, and there are various ways we are going to be discussing the most uh, uh, comfortable way, the, the, uh, the saliva test. And the, once the sample comes to the lab, first the order of the day is to inactivate the virus to protect the, the people work with the samples. So the virus is inactivated, then the RNA is extracted. Some cases RNA extract is bypassed, and then it goes to the next step of our reverse transcription. Uh, uh, that's to say, to transform this unstable molecule into the complementary DNA, the cDNA, that's going to be used as the uh, template for the qPCR reaction. The qPCR reaction utilizes enzymes, nucleotides, buffer, primers in the probe, and all these things can come together in one mix that's called the master mix. Uh, and the first step then is to utilize uh, the reverse transcriptase, an enzyme and the primers to uh, transcribe, reverse transcribe the RNA into cDNA uh, in a process initially to generate a more stable template. So here's an original template of the RNA and the, the uh, transcribed, the, the reverse transcribed cDNA. Now with the cDNA, we have the template, we're going to start the uh, PCR reaction. The first step in the PCR reaction is to separate the strands of his uh, DNA because they form hydrogen bonds. And then separate that, and the next step is to undergo hybridization, that is to anneal the primer uh, with the sequence that you wanted to amplify. And then finally, the DNA synthesis utilizes another enzyme that's going to undergo amplification and extension. So this all occurs uh, in one cycle, this all steps change the temperature back and forth in different times, and the, the reaction keeps going and repeat itself. Uh, for the primers, uh, we utilize primers for certain part of the sequence. In the case of the United States, most of the primers have been utilized are the two sets of primers uh, uh, targeting the uh, region of the genome of the virus that encodes for the uh, N protein. Other countries utilize other uh, parts of the uh, sequence of the virus. And the, for example, in the United Kingdom, one of the primers that they use, they use three sets of primers. One of the primers for the spike protein. That's how they end up discovering that there was a very important variant in this coronavirus that is called now the British uh, variant uh, B117. I guess that comes from the United Kingdom, should be 007. Uh, that's why they discovered by utilizing this, uh, this the process of the PCR reaction that one of the set of primers was not working, but the other two were working. So they were able to discover this very important variant. The primers uh, in the United States, again, we use two sets of primers recommended by, uh, by CDC. One is uh, set N1. There's always a set of primers that is a reverse and forward prime. Uh, the yellow represents the forward prime here, and the blue uh, represents this uh, reverse prime. There are two sets of primers in the region of the N protein. Now, with the template, with the cDNA that was prepared, uh, and these two set of primers, the enzymes and the other reagents and the uh, nucleotides, uh, the reaction is going to take place. Uh, and every time we duplicate the number of copies that we have by one cycle of this reaction. So the more accurate it goes, the more uh, samples we get. Uh, and initially, depends on the amount of samples that we have at the beginning, the amplification is going to go very fast. 
because it is an exponential process. Uh, the probes are uh, oligonucleotides, the same as the primers, except that they have uh, uh, one fluorophore at one end and a quencher on the other end. Fluorophore is a chemical substance that is, uh, emits fluorescent light. When we excite with certain light, it emits a light of a different frequency. Uh, and then we can detect whether uh, a DNA is there or not by this fluorophore. How we do this? is that these probes, they do not emit fluorescence because of the quencher. However, when the quencher is separated from the fluorophore, then uh, they, the fluorophore can fluoresce. And how this thing happens is that this probe is that's going to anneal to a certain sequence of the target that you wanted to amplify. And once the enzyme is amplified, the enzymes get rid of everything that they encounter in front of it, including the probe. So once the enzyme destroy the probe and they amplify that the cDNA, uh, now the fluorophore is separate from the quencher and therefore it can emit fluorescence. And the more molecules of this fluorescence it means more molecule of cDNA. Here's a, a graph that shows the fluorescence intensity versus the number of cycles. And here we see that at some point the fluorescence increases very dramatically and it then gets reached a certain plateau. Here's another curve. Uh, let's see that these were two separate patients looking for one of the two primers, set of primers here, like N1 or N2. Uh, on the left, we see that the numbers of cycles was much smaller to get to a certain threshold than the uh, sample, the blue sample on the right side. So it means that you started with a larger number of cops. For example, if you get a patient that has a larger number of cops, a high infection rate, uh, that patient might produce uh, a CT that's very low compared to another one that's still infected but not a larger number of cops. CDC determined that the threshold for that is 40 cycles for N1, N2, and also for a control that they use. The control that they use is a positive control is a human RNAZP. RNAZP is a RNA, is also an enzyme, and it's very common in any part of the body you can collect that enzyme. So if you collect the sample and we collect this RNAZP, then we are going to be able to check the quality of the sample. Uh, and also they use a positive control. The positive control is more to see the quality of the work of the reagent and the lab itself, if everything is functional, we use a non-infection form of this SARS-CoV-2. And that's only to determine if there is a level uh, of detection that's appropriate in the lab setting. Uh, the interpretation of the results is such that the threshold value is 40 cycles. Uh, so if both sets of primers for any one and any two gave it smaller than four cycles, regardless of we don't even if to have to look at our NAZP, you can conclude that this is a positive. This came from a patient with the, the coronavirus because the number of cycles was not did needed many cycles to be able to come to a certain level of fluorescence there. Now, the opposite of that is a situation where you need so many cycles, more than 40 to, have, have to reach the threshold. That means that this is not significant. This could be a background uh, uh, signal from fluorophore itself. However, you have to look at that point what happens with the CT from the RNAZP because it tells about the quality of the sample. If you have a CT less than 4 for RNA-SP, that means you have a good quality sample, but we could not find the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So therefore, this result is negative. Now what happens is if both curves are above 40, uh, and the, uh, the CT of the uh, rna -SP also is above 40, it means that this is not a good quality sample. So you cannot conclude whether this lack of evidence for the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is because the sample is not good or is because it's not there. So this is inconclusive, this is invalid results, you have to repeat this result. The same thing if you get a CT above 40 and if for one of the set of primers and for the other set of primers with CT below 40, this is inconclusive, it's inconsistent. Both primers, both set of primers 
should amplify equally, so it should not be considered this sample. So this is a very uh, simple summary of what we do. There is much more detail to that, but I hope that this background information would help you to understand the more complex high-throughput system that we are going to be talking about today.